Um, thank, thank you for the invitation. Um, the perspective that I want to inject here is one that comes from the side of theory, which I think is, is lacking a little bit in, in neuroscience in general, and the, an understanding of how we should organize the many data sets that we now have at our disposal into a coherent framework. And one of the frameworks that I've been pursuing, it's not the only one possible, but one that I've been pursuing is that of network science or, or complex systems. I've been working in the intersection for many years now of complex systems and networks on one side, more physics, computer science oriented, and uh, neuroscience on the other. And uh, when I talk about networks, what I mean is not a metaphor or, 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 or just a, a very general descriptor of, of many neurons connected, but it's actually a particular mathematical model of, or data structure that consists of nodes and interconnecting edges. Uh, it turns out that the network science approaches have made a lot of impact in many different disciplines, from social sciences to technology and also the biological sciences, for example, in systems biology. They're now making an, an impact also in neuroscience, and I want to argue here in my next uh, 28 minutes or so uh, about uh, the potential impact they can have, the insights they can deliver in understanding neurobiological systems, particularly in the context of comparative connectomics. I'll introduce a little bit about networks at the beginning, talk about comparative analyses across species in a number of, uh, with a number of different methodologies, then talk about human brain just a little bit, and end with an idea that pulls it all together, I hope. Uh, we have at our disposal now in neuroscience more and more data sets that are comprehensive, rich, uh, big, uh, in, in the sense of big data, and that refer to and describe relations among elements, whether they are molecules that interact with each, with, with each other in cells, or uh, individuals or, uh, organizing themselves into a social network, or in the middle of this diagram, a, a vast space of potential connectomic approaches uh, from single neuron networks that are interconnected to the circuits, all the way up to whole brain uh, macro-scale projections among brain regions. Uh, all of these data sets are inherently networks. They report relational data among elements, pairs of elements typically, and can therefore be analyzed, modeled, investigated with the tools of network science. There's a giant tool set available to us. We are only scratching in our field the very uh, surface of it. Everybody here who has a cell phone or, or is on a so within a social network, Twitter or Facebook, we are embedded in networks all the time. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a reason why these methodologies have, have sort of come to the forefront in, in, in these past five or 10 years. There's many descriptive tools we have available to us. Um, very simple measures, such as how many connections does a node have? That's the node degree. Uh, how cliquish is the neighborhood of a node, the clustering coefficient, or the decomposition of a larger network into subgraphs or motifs that, that actually allow us to see what the building blocks of these networks look like. Very important concepts also are distance. If information is to be transmitted through a network, what is the minimal number of steps that have to be taken? Graph theory and network science can give the answers to those questions. Very important in our field, I think, is also modularity, the notion that uh, biological networks have uh, clusters of more densely connected elements that, that are more, more strongly interacting with each other. And corresponding to that, there are some specific nodes which are very important for maintaining connectivity between modules. We call those network hubs. We can find these modules and hubs using data-driven methodologies, for example, community detection and network science. Uh, building on that, a higher order concept is that of a rich club, which is the interaction of highly connected rich nodes with each other. And in fact, in many biological networks, not all, we find that uh, these types of connectivity exist, and they are, I think, very important, particularly in the brain. So I'll be using these terms and these measures throughout the rest of my talk. Comparative connectomics really is the study of, of network um, descriptions of whole brain or perhaps circuits and networks across different species. And we have in our possession now currently a handful of species, including humans, about which I'll say more at the end of the talk, but also invertebrate species, uh, the nematodes, the elegans, uh, the zophila, and a variety of vertebrates and, and uh, mammalian species as well. So that sets up an opportunity for us to compare, to look for commonalities as well as perhaps differences in the, in the principles by which these networks are organized and configured, the topological uh, architectural principles that we, that we, could, uh, can, actually, uh, that we can actually uh, dis discern. The field kind of began uh, with what I call the moonshot in this, in, this, in this field, which is the reconstruction from EM uh, and micrographs largely by hand, 
uh, of the complete nervous system at the neuronal level of the nematodes, the elegans. This was carried out over 30 years ago at Cambridge, and this wiring diagram has been with us uh, for a number of decades now. And despite the fact that we've, that we've had it for such a long time, there's new things being discovered about the wiring of the worm all the time as new tools become available. Just a few highlights from a few studies recently uh, um, that, that I want to share with you. First of all, these networks at the neuronal level are quite sparse, um, only about 3% density here of chemical synapses, um, and they have highly clustered connections. Neighbors, uh, if, two, if two neurons are connected to each other, there's also a high chance that they're connecting to common partners in their neighborhood. Uh, they have lo there's a long tail dis distribution of, of degree, which means that some neurons have more connections than most others. And there is evidence for modularity and for the existence of uh, a rich club, which means highly connected neurons also have a high, a high tendency to be connected amongst each other, more so than expected by chance. Another invertebrate species, a uh, very important model organism, uh, Dosophila, uh, that, that we have looked at in collaboration with C.T. Shi and um, uh, Anshin Chiang in Taiwan, uh, fluorescent imaging of individual neurons that are then mapped into a common reference framework, a spatial template, uh, superimposed uh, and, col and, co and collected into a common network of 40, uh, 47 or 49 local processing unit, units that then report the density of connections between these units. Uh, evidence, once again, for modularity, modular organizations, the, module that the modules we extract based on network science uh, technique, uh, map onto um, known uh, subdivisions of the Zofla brain engaged in different types of behavior. Moving forward quite rapidly here to the uh, efforts of the Allen Institute in the mouse connectome. Uh, that's been a, an epic effort, very important for the field, uh, and the, uh, the connectivity data coming, coming out of the Allen Institute has been, has been looked at in multiple ways now since it's been first published, including in a study by Ed Bulmore and, and Mika Rubinov, uh, to look at uh, modularity, once again, evident in this network, and Rich club organization, highly connected brain regions in the uh, singlet cortex, the, the prefrontal cortex, and the thalamus and other subcortical regions that are not only highly connected in terms of having many connections to many other regions, but also having connections that are dense uh, amongst each other, denser than expected by chance. Moving forward to my own work here with Larry Swanson at USC in the RAT, and this is a very different approach looking at the existing track tracing literature, which is very extensive in the RAT, with thousands of papers that report on connections between various subdivisions of cortical and subcortical regions. And Larry's project is to systematically data mine this existing literature and then collate those connection reports into a common matrix of connectivity. This results in a directed connection matrix that you see here, for example, for one hemisphere of the cerebral cortex. Every entry in this matrix has behind it usually not just one, but multiple connection reports coming from the track tracing literature. And these connections are not only directed, but they can also be uh, assigned a, at least an ordinal strength in terms of their magnitude. Uh, and again, analyzing this uh, with, with, with Larry and co-workers um, provides evidence for uh, significant modularity, the existence of clusters that are somewhat discrete from each other, coupled to each other with high degree hubs. And these hubs are also interconnected amongst each other to form a so-called rich club organization. By now you notice that I'm repeating myself in terms of the features I'm pointing out. And there's a storyline here. I'm doing this for a purpose because I'm going to tell you at the end why we find these commonalities, at least the ideas we have about why we find these common features in very different species. Um, if we look at these modules, we project them back onto what Larry calls a cortical flat map. Uh, we can discern their spatial relations. Um, they typically com comprise brain regions that are adjacent to each other, uh, form sort of um, coherent territories on the cortical surface. And uh, that is a hint as to why these modules might exist. Uh, most intramodular connections in the rat, as well as in other species, tend to be short in distance. They tend to be made between uh, regions uh, in these nervous systems or between neurons and C. elegans that are spatially close to each other. The notion of space will be a very important one to keep in mind for the discussion at the end. We've extended our studies with Larry uh, gradually, including additional subdivisions of the rat brain. Uh, this was our previous effort from last year, uh, looking at the bihemispheric uh, connectivity in the cerebral cortex. So now we have two cortical hemispheres of cerebral cortex coupled by commissural connections. The commissural connections are shown here in this diagram in the upper uh, quadrangle. This line that goes through here, these are the homotopic connections linking 
corresponding brain regions from the left to the right. Uh, other connections are, would be heterotopic, uh, chromosomal connection. This allowed us for the first time, I think, uh, uh, although similar studies have now been carried out with the Allen data in the mouse, to look at commissal connections, connections between the two cortical hemispheres and what their patterns might be. Not a lot of data available, systematic data available in that, in that space from other vertebrate or mammalian species. Uh, this involved a fairly large number of connection reports. The diagram, the connection matrix you saw is quite complete, about 96% filled, so there's evidence behind almost every entry in that matrix. And when you look at, at the statistics of these commissal connections, about two-thirds of the homotopic connections that could exist actually do, so not all of them are in existence. And uh, the number of commissal connections overall is quite small. It's really an exact logical subset of all the connections that we find in, within one hemisphere. So in other words, if you have a commissal connection, either heterotopic or homotopic, you will find a corresponding association connection within the same hemisphere. The universe is not true. Uh, so there's a, there's a sort of a logical relationship between these. Furthermore, if you, are, if you have a strong association projection on one hemisphere, the likelihood of finding a corresponding homotopic or heterotopic projection is actually increasing with the strength of the, of the association projection. These are sort of some simple rules we can extract from these connectivity analyses. Uh, it's an open question as to whether they apply uh, across other species as well. In our latest iteration, which will hit the press, I think, next week in PNIS, uh, we're looking at the uh, connections in between the two cortical hemispheres and within and between the two cortical hemispheres plus the connections within and between the basal ganglia and all interconnections between these structures as well. So this is now 244 regions, fairly large matrix to look at. Here's a rendering of it in a modular ordering where we have applied modular detection uh, approaches to define uh, modules and, uh, and display our connection matrix showing these dense clusters uh, in, their, um, uh, in, their, in, in, their, in their great glory. Uh, of course, we, 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 we can dig into this at infinite detail, and we have in the paper to some extent, to look at what is the membership of, of regions in these clusters, where are they, how do they relate to each other, what else do we know about them physiologically, etc. And this offers a very rich playing field for further and deeper analysis, obviously. What we deployed here for the first time is a new technique for module detection that we developed uh, separately with our colleagues at Indiana University. Uh, uh, about a year earlier, and that's called multi-resolution con uh, consensus clustering. It gets at the point that in any complex network, modular organization clustering does not only occur on one level of scale, but actually usually occurs on multiple levels of scale. So you think of clusters within clusters within clusters, nested arrangements of clusterings that get finer and finer that you can detect uh, using uh, modularity detection techniques in network science using uh, various mathematical approaches. We have uh, built a consensus from the various clusterings that we find in a, in a hierarchical uh, tree that shows us actually which, how these different clusters relate to each other, uh, sort of like a nested um, arrangement of clusters within clusters that we can uh, uh, deploy and analyze further. Um, a, a, a brief aside here, this is all so far has been, you know, it's been anatomy, it's been interregional projections. I just want to briefly say that we can apply network science technology also to time series data and to data coming from spiking networks. This is a uh, work uh, that was done by John Beggs uh, at, at IU and where we have collaborated with him a little bit over the years. Using a measure called transfer entropy, we can actually um, use spike trains and we can, we can infer um, uh, putative patterns information flow between, between spike trains, essentially looking at uh, how information is transferred between spike trains and how taking, the, taking into account the past of one spike train can improve the prediction of the future of, of a given spike train. Uh, transfer entropy is quite powerful as a technique, especially in, spike, in spiking networks, and can then allow us to extract information flow networks from, um, from such data. Uh, this has been applied by John in, uh, in the context of uh, mouse cortical slice cultures um, uh, that are plated on a multi-electrode array allowing the recording of several hundred neurons at the same time. And just a highlight here from, from a paper we had a, a couple of years ago now with Sunny Niga, I'm a student. Um, we, we can build um, networks, obviously, from that, and then look for features such as uh, which club organization. Once again, 
A uh, couple of things that really were striking to me about this data is that not all neurons, quote, are created equal. There are some neurons that have more connections, incoming and outgoing, in terms of information flows than others. And those neurons also tend to be very densely connected, tend to share information with each other, uh, even accounting for all potential uh, biases that might get in the way. So Wishup organization seems to be a feature that's actually not just um, happening at the macro scale of interregional projections, but also might be happening at the level of micro, uh, of micro circuits. And in this context, I want to just uh, briefly mention the work that was done here by Eyal Gal in Idan's lab, um, uh, looking at anatomical rich type organization, uh, cell type specific uh, associations between uh, anatomical connections in, in microcircuits. Uh, for me, a very important paper that um, highlights again the, uh, the fact that some of these network features are actually found across different scales, not just species. Just a few words about humans. When I first got interested in the, in the human brain, uh, when, or in the brain in general, uh, what we knew about the human brain in terms of anatomy came largely from histology or, or, or postmodern dissection. So for instance, atlases like this, that literally, literally is a photograph of a person's brain that's been dissected, and you can see these, uh, these bundles of so-called white matter tracts that go between uh, regions of, over long distances in the inside of the brain. Uh, there's a big disadvantage here. This person is dead. And so you cannot actually bring this person back to the lab, uh, interrogate them in terms of their cognitive behavioral characteristics. You can't bring them back a second time, look at developmental patterns. We needed a, a non-invasive technology to do this over uh, that is relatively cheap, uh, a non-invasive, and can be deployed in, in larger cohorts of subjects. And we got this technique in the form of diffusion imaging and tractography. And I want to emphasize a couple of things right away. Uh, this is what you see here. It's not a photograph, obviously. It's a picture of, of inferred trajectories of white matter fibers. There's a process here of inference of literally modeling a diffusion signal with likely trajectories of fiber bundles that go through the, in the, in the interior of the brain. Um, every modeling approach has issues with false positives and false negatives. Um, and these certainly exist in this technology. So not everything that you see in this picture or any picture that you see from diffusion imaging and uh, tractography is, per is perfectly accurate. However, it is a, has provided an absolutely field-changing, unique window on uh, human anatomy in living humans that we can also image with other modalities that we can study with other uh, behavioral cognitive variables where we can relate the inter-subject variants that we see to phenotypic and genotype uh, characteristics. It's opened a whole new field that's been exploding, really, in, in human neuroscience over the last decade or so. Working with uh, Patrick Hagman at, uh, at Lausanne, uh, I, uh, I started early on with working with Patrick, uh, building networks from these uh, data sets that he created. And quite early in, in, in the game, with a total of five subjects in the first study, by the way, very big data, um, we found these unique um, characteristics that have since been found again and again in many, many replications and follow-ups to our original report. Every region that we look at in the brain has a unique connectivity fingerprint, a unique pattern of inputs and outputs. This is, this is critical because in a network, if you take that notion seriously, what you can do, the contribution that you can make to the overall functioning of the system is largely the result, largely perhaps, but to a certain extent the result of the inputs and outputs you receive. Um, it's very much a, a, a function of the connectivity fingerprint that you maintain, and it's unique for every brain region. Uh, there's a broad degree distribution. Once again, some, most brain regions have a middling number of connections, but there are some that have a lot more. Uh, there's high clustering in short path length. Uh, communication can occur rather, rather freely. There are modules that we can find with, with various techniques of detecting these in, in, in connectivity data, and they are, the modules are interconnected by hubs, which are themselves interconnected densely, more so than expected by chance, into a core, what we called a core initially, or later called a rich club. Just one last time about the rich club. Why do we care about it so much? Why have we said so much about it here? Uh, it's, I think, a perfect structural substrate for integrating information in the brain. Uh, let's, let's rehearse this together a little bit. So here on the left, we have a, a simple a schematic of a network with four modules, which are internally somewhat dense and externally somewhat sparse, sparsely connected. And you can see a few highlighted um, nodes here that clearly are important for communication between these modules. These are our hubs. Now we add a few more connections between these hubs directly. Now we've got an architecture where 
hubs can essentially collect information from local communities and can then share the information between each other relatively quickly uh, without too many intermediate steps. Uh, we believe that this is an important potential substrate for information integration, which many believe is important in terms of brain function globally, perhaps even for consciousness. Uh, and we, are there, we were therefore very interested in looking at red stop organization uh, in various nervous systems. We started working with Martin Wannenheuvel for a number of years now and have looked at this over and over again. Again, it's been replicated in many other studies. Um, the key, the key picture here, the key graph is the one with, uh, that shows this peak, which is the access of connectivity among richly connected uh, nodes in the brain over a, over a null model where the, where the degree has been preserved, but the global topology has been destroyed. Uh, rich, club, rich club regions are quite familiar to cognitive neuroscientists, for instance, the insula on both sides, cingulate cortex, and regions of the medial parietal cortex, which are typically labeled association regions or multimodal regions of the brain that um, we now discover are also mutually interconnected uh, at some high density. Uh, uh, the, uh, if you look at communication paths between any pair of nodes within the human brain, you want to pass a message and you pick the shortest possible way to do it, uh, you, will know, you will discover that despite the fact that the rich club only uh, uh, occupies about 10% of the brain, 90% of those messages have to go through it. If we, dis if we disturb the rich club, if something happens to those nodes, to those precious hub nodes that are interconnected amongst, amongst each other or the connections that, that interconnect them, there's a disproportionate effect on communication in network models. And in fact, uh, there have now been dozens, perhaps hundreds of studies in clinical neuroscience looking at pathophysiological processes that, that attack, specifically attack hub nodes and manifest themselves in various cognitive and behavioral deficits. Finally, uh, in my last remaining minutes, I want to lay out a few ideas for you that are perhaps not as coherent yet, but I want to, to, I want to sort of um, um, uh, um, work through with you because they relate to one of the themes of this workshop, which is about comparative analyses uh, and perhaps what makes us human. So uh, bear with me for a moment. I've, I've gone through a number of different species, from, from a nematode, a very humble organism, to humans, not so humble, and I've, I've shown you that there's a lot of commonality in terms of the network attributes that we find. Despite the obvious differences in size and complexity, we find modularity, uh, degree distributions that are broad, uh, rich club organization, and all these organisms. All of these features that I've, that I've come to, uh, uh, that I've repeatedly, repeatedly referred to in my talk, are really shared across different organisms and perhaps even across different scales in one organism, such as uh, uh, the mouse. Where is this coming from? Why does the brain look like that? What is driving these architectural commonalities? Why shouldn't the brain of a worm look totally different than the brain of a, of a, of a highly evolved mammal such as ourselves? One of the big things, one of the big factors, in, especially in, in anatomy, in wiring diagrams that shapes the topology of these networks, I think, has to do with space, has to do with spatial embedding. These are all networks that have to be physically built. They have to actually fit between your ears. They have to be, they have to be energetically uh, sustainable. They have, to, they have to be developmentally sustainable. And that, uh, that, that basic constraint of, of cost, I'm going to call it cost, of volume, of energy, uh, of wiring length, uh, I think plays a major role in, uh, in, in, in determining which connections are actually present and which, and which isn't, and, 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 and which aren't. In fact, that idea goes back, it's not my idea, it goes back all the way to Cajal uh, to some extent and has been proposed a number of times since then, so it's not an original idea we've proposed. But there's, but there's something else on top. Because if the, all the brain wanted to do is minimize cost, then we wouldn't have a brain at all. That's the, that's the minimum, that's the absolute minimum. No, no brain at all, no neurons, no connections, that's really cheap. But of course, that wouldn't work to control behavior. So there is, of course, another dimension here, which I'm going to broadly call efficiency, which has to do with performance, with, with something that connections add uh, to, to, to performance of a, of a nervous system. And what especially is added to the performance of a brain uh, in, terms of, in terms of cost, of long distance, of long distance connections, but are, which are particularly costly in terms of the volume that they take up and the energy they consume. So there's sort of two things to this. We have on the one side common features that are minimizing costs, such as modules and short connections, but then we also have features that um, go, go against the cost principle, minimization principle, 
and confer value or efficiency to the overall architecture, such as long distance projections between the modules. And that sets up a framework or an idea that, that I've uh, worked on with at Bullmore for, for a while now. Uh, it sort of says um, there's, two, there's at least two different forces that have shaped the architecture of the brain, let's say over evolutionary time. One force is the brain wants to be cheap. It wants to keep connections short while maintaining connectedness. This will give you a brain that looks like this. I think you can see right away that that's a very inefficient brain if you want to transmit information from the back to the front. Not, 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 not a very efficient way of doing this. On the other side, if, you, if that's what you care about, your brain would be random because random networks, perhaps absurdly, uh, are very good at transmitting information. However, they are extremely costly to implement. So these connections that are made uh, willy-nilly across the interior of the brain would, would, would essentially occupy so much volume that your brain would have to be you know, several feet wide, and uh, for reasons that Chris Walsh mentioned the other day, uh, that's not going to work. So, um, so there's a, there's a trade-off here. On the one side, uh, cost preservation. On the other side, maximizing efficiency or performance. And that sets up a uh, multi-objective optimization uh, framework, really. We can think of brains as emerging from uh, an optimization process um, where these two somewhat incongruous features or dimensions are being jointly maximized. And in engineering, that gives rise to the notion of a Pareto fund, Pareto, uh, an Italian economist from the 20th century, early 20th century. Uh, those optimal architectures are found on the front. Uh, they, if, you, if, you, if you optimally de design a system, those solutions will form the, the surface of this bubble. You cannot go beyond that because then the system breaks down. Uh, other suboptimal solutions are behind this front and are so-called dominated solutions. We have worked on, on actually implementing generative models, wiring models uh, that build uh, optimal architectures using different criteria optimization and, and Pareto front criteria, but I don't have time to go into this. I want to add to this one more idea and then I'm done. The notion of morphospace, which comes from evolutionary biology. Uh, and from the, from the pioneering work of David Raup and gastropods and later work on foraminifers, which are very small uh, organisms that live in the, in the ocean mostly and build um, uh, uh, calcium uh, carbonate shells that have certain uh, geometry to it. Here's the idea. Think of uh, a generative process that creates all possible shells. You can actually build a little computer program, this is the output of it, that varies some geometric parameters that build certain shells. This is the space of all possible shells that you can build using these three parameters. What evolutionary biologists then ask are, what are the actual foraminifers that we find in nature? Where are they in this space? And the answer is, for almost every morphospace analysis that's been carried out, the actual forms that you find, either living or in the fossil record, occupy a very small portion of the space of all possible forms. So not all possible forms exist or have ever existed. Only a small subset of them do. That sets up the interesting question. That's why people are interested in it. Why those? Why not the others? Now we're taking one leap of imagination. Stay with me. Think of, think of networks as, as morphological objects for a moment. Think of brains as, as geometric morphological objects. Perhaps we can, we can imagine for a moment the space of all possible brains. It's, of course, you know, so big as to literally make your own brain explode, which is very postmodern. But um, it's, it, it, you know, just, just think of it for a moment. And then ask the question, the human brain and the brains that we find in nature today occupy a very small portion of that possible space. And that sets up the question, why that portion of space? Why not another? Why aren't our brains wired differently? And uh, we, can, we can build uh, um, generative models and, and, and use modeling approaches of various kinds to ask the question, why, how did we get there uh, with respect to the human brain into this particular region of the so-called network morphospace, and how can we trace our, our path to that position given, uh, for example, random networks. Here, what you see on the left is a space of, of uh, social, technological, ecological, and random networks uh, of all different kinds. Interesting, again, the interesting phenomenon here is that not, not all possible network topologies actually exist. The ones that we actually find in social networks, in, in the brain, and in, 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 in ecology, form a very small subset of the possibilities that, that exist in principle. Clearly, those networks have been selected for functionality, for the, for the efficiency they provide, for the cost that they minimize. 
And the game that we want to play now, in, in one of the things we want to do in a lab, is to actually um, in, investigate this concept further and understand better why the brain, human brain, and other brains look the way they do. So in other words, the future goal is to, is to build a network morphospace space uh, across many different species. And uh, this session is perfect because uh, in the next talk, I think you'll see uh, how, we, how we might be able to do this. Um, final thought is that uh, networks are very important, I think, in, in neuroscience these days. It's not the only way that by, by which we can model brains or neurobiological systems, but it's a very important one, in part because it articulates between brain on one side and many other domains of science on the other, from social networks to, to systems biology and so forth. And most neurobiological processes that we're interested in uh, unfold on many different levels of organization, from, from networks among mo molecules, which we've, which we've heard about here as well yesterday, to networks at the whole brain level. And the importance of networks, uh, and, the, and the fact that I have very, uh, very uh, an abundance of, of, of spare time available, um, uh, compelled me uh, a couple of years ago to start a new journal called Network Neuroscience, which is, which is in the intersection of network science on one side, drawing in people from physics and computer science, and um, neuroscience on the other, across all levels of scale, all different systems, computational, theoretical, and empirical. And the journal is now in its, uh, entering its third year of publication, and I recommend to you to take a look at it, and perhaps you want to submit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I think we should limit ourselves to one question. It's a great question, and the structure-function relationship has been one that we have worked on a lot in the lab. There was no space in this, in this talk for it. So we look, for example, at, on the one side, functional, you know, time series recordings, imperfect, imperfect as they are, with, with bold signals from, from fMRI. On the other side, the anatomy coming from diffusion. The they can be co-registered to each other. We can ask questions about uh, what the status is of, hub, of anatomical hubs in the functional networks we construct. The answer is, is complicated in that it's not a one-to-one -one match between, let's say, structural hubs and what we might call functional hubs. Functional hubs are difficult to define for reasons that I can't get into. But, but there is efforts underway, also in our lab, to, in, to really get together these two domains. I agree with you. However, I have a, uh, a predilection for viewing the brain in structural terms, uh, in part because I got my first degree in biochemistry, and I was very fond at that time of protein molecules. And, was very impressed always by how much you could understand about the function of a molecule by looking at its structure. And I think that this, this, the anatomical structure, the wiring diagram broadly conceived, is, is really a, uh, a fundamental, that's why we call it a connectome, a fundamental, it's really a foundation for understanding everything else that emerges from it. Knowing that what emerges from it is not going to be just a replica of it or determined by it in a strict way, um, but the anatomy defines it eliminates 99.99% of all possibilities of interaction that can't take place anymore. But the ones that, that can occur don't always occur all at once. They occur in, in, in time-dependent patterns. They occur in patterns that are obviously related to, to, to task, to input, uh, to state of, of the brain. And from there on, it becomes a, 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 a really a, a plethora of functional networks that can actually exist over time. But for me personally, I want to emphasize, I want to emphasize in this talk uh, the importance of, of anatomy and of connectivity uh, uh, in a brain-wide setting as a foundation for everything else that we, can, that, we, that we can then build on top of that. Thank you. Thanks a lot again.